that I introduce my dear friend and colleague here at the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, the Venerable Professor Wangchuk Dorje Negi, who is going to discuss Professor Tilakaratne's uh, paper from this morning. You shall start. Namo Buddhaya. Uh, my greeting to the uh, respected Professor Jela, uh, the moderator of this session, and uh, Professor Asank Jilak Rataniji, who, whose paper I am responding, and all the distinguished uh, scholars on the dais and the August gathering. At the outset, I would like to thank Professor Jilak Ratani for your wonderful presentation. Also, I would like to say, sorry, uh, as my English is very poor, uh, to speak such a uh, uh, August gathering, therefore instead of speaking uh, randomly or with a strained accent, so I have written down some question uh, or some point in response to the Professor Tilak uh, Rataniji paper, which I uh, got uh, opportunity to read in advance, uh, so I would like to go through that. Uh, on the page number four, <coughs> your paper, uh, you have said, I quote, the conditions that comes together to produce a phenomena themselves being then arising ultimately what there is a web of dependent arising phenomena of which nothing in itself has independent existence. When you say which nothing in itself has independent existence, for example, in terms of uh, object like this paper, uh, uh, since this paper is made of the atom, uh, this paper itself has, does not, uh, any existence, inherent existence other than the existence of the aggregates of the atom. Likewise, just as there is no existence of the paper by itself, similarly, if the subtlest form of the matter, such as the quark or the string, also do not exist, then everything will be empty like a vacuum, which then leads to the uh, question as to how do things come into the being then, therefore need to be way as things cannot arise from the vacuum like the emptiness. Hence, when the explaining dependent origination, the Buddha has said that due to the existence of this that arises, due to the production of this that produced, Hence, my query is, if so, then the for example, according to Buddhism, like this paper's primary course, is like four elements or atoms, while science, either uh, electron, neutron, proton, or something, quark, or string, is taken as a primary course of the whole matters, according to science. So likewise, although, Mind is something that is without uh, physical form and uh, difficult to pinpoint. Yet, since the uh, entire Buddhist teaching emphasizes mind training or the taming the mind, there seems to be a necessity to know what the primary cause of mind is. So, I would appreciate if Professor uh, Ratne could uh, uh, share some on this uh, according to the Thayvat point of view. And my second query is also related to the uh, previous point. Air are sentient beings. I mean uh, those possessing uh, consciousness ever in a state when they do not possess consciousness or in other words become a non sentient Sometimes in the Abhidhamma text, it is said that an individual does not possess consciousness while abiding in the state of two absorption, non-perceptive absorption and the absorption of cessation. This means that they are non-sentient 
at that particular time, which would imply that mind is thing that is newly born, wouldn't it? Then, in that case, what would make a person sentient being at the time when they are without mind or consciousness? If they do possess his consciousness during that time, then we will have to accept the ever existence of the continuity of the mind in form of luminosity or awareness or some thing similar with the potential. If that is so, then what is the distinction between non-Buddhist Atman and the Buddhist <coughs> ever existing mind in the form of luminosity or awareness? Now my third point is, with reference to a point mentioned on your page 3, your paper, if I understood your point correctly, uh, if the Nama Rupa of empirical individual cannot be divided sharply into mind and body, as you have mentioned in your paper, then what about the formless realm? Does it mean that the mind and matter is same or one? If they are same or one, then what is difference between the rupa of empirical individual and the rupa of non sentient object? If the rupa and mind of the sentient being is same, then the mind of the sentient being will be both matter and mind. Similarly, rupa of the sentient being will be both matter and mind. If it is not same, then it will be independence. If it is independent, then how can we establish the relation between the mind and body? Another question I have is, what is the nature of Chetsika mental factor according to the Theravada? I would like to know whether they are mind or matter or other than the mind or matter. The ever question and answer will be shaped like on, uh, like on the existence of mind and body from the Theravada uh, point of view. Uh, lastly, okay. lastly, I would like to share a brief comparison between Theravada and my view on the dependent origination. Uh, I agree with your presentation on how even during the Buddha's time, Bhikkhu, Sati and other face difficulty differentiating between the mind and Atma. And I agree with your resolving the issue of confusion over the mind and Atma through the mind being as nothing beyond a web of the relation. If we accept all phenomena as independently originated, then all phenomena uh, lacks inherent existence if this happened, then there wouldn't be conflict of identifying the doers of the action and the action itself and the consumer of the objects and the objects to be consumed. Likewise, the goer and the action of the going and so on. Thus, the problem of identifying whether they are uh, one or separate will be definitely solved. Because it is said that in the essential interdependent origination, through the example of oral instruction, a lamp, a mirror, a seal, a sun crystal, a seed, soreness, and sound, the wise should be understand the non transmigration as well as the re emergence of the aggregate. Also, in the Madhyamik Karika, Nagarjuna says, Whatever comes into being dependent on the another is not identical to the things, nor is it different from it. Therefore, it is neither non existence in time nor permanent. <clears throat> this profound concept of lack of inherent existence is indeed the uh, philosophy of interdependent origination or web of the relation according to the Acharya Nagarjuna. However, I do not know whether things described as a web of relation in Theravada correlated to the same profound view as held by Acharya Nagarjuna or not. If they correlate, then there will be no difference between the Theravada and Mahayana. However, 
you have mentioned in your paper that Theravadin Abhidhammas refers to four ultimate reality, namely the mind, Chitta, factor of the mind, Chetsika, matter, Rupa, and the Nibbana. Because according to the Mahayana, Theravad and Sarvastivadin accept the partless particle of the atom and partless moment of the consciousness, perhaps you would clarify a bit on this question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venerable. Thank you very much for the comments. Uh, of course, these comments are so uh, vast and you know covering large areas. So you can't expect me to respond within a couple of minutes, and neither I'm not going to try that. But let me make uh, some uh, general uh, remarks. For example. Um, this uh, Theravada or early Buddhist uh, characterization of uh, mind as uh, dependently uh, arisen phenomena. So uh, nothing in itself is uh, independently existing. Now, interesting thing is, um, the, uh, as you noticed and in my paper, I have given instances where the immediate, some of the immediate disciples of the Buddha found it very difficult to uh, deal with this, uh, you know, the philosophical concept. I mean, the difficulty in uh, speaking about uh, certain things without uh, reference to an agent, but that, that was precisely what the Buddha wanted to get away with. However, it is very interesting that uh, when you look from a commonsensical point of view, you always ask this question. Uh, what about the doer? Like, you know, for example, uh, one example I have given in the paper is the ice, what we call uh, uh, Chitta Anupassana. Chitta Anupassana, reflection of the mind, on, the, on the mind. Now, who is, who is reflecting on the mind? Then, of course, you know, it looks like you have to really posit some kind of uh, mind is there and there is someone who is reflecting on that. So, they are, you know, the very... Uh, the, the relationship seems to be that we have to assume that there is some, someone else who is looking at it. But the way I consider how to overcome this problem is, now if Buddhism talks about mind as completely independent, solitary thing, then of course somebody can question who is the person who is looking at the mind. But if you take this as a dependently arisen phenomenon, then of course every time you are talking about mind, you are talking about Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vinya, all five aggregates. In other words, although for technical, uh, pedagogical uh, reasons, you talk about mind as if mind exists um, on its own, actually there is no such a thing called mind in that sense existing independently for the dualism. So therefore there is no issue coming up like, you know, when you separate the two mind and, and body. So I think this is the, the, the point where ultimately uh, you look at mind as a, a web of relations, the word I use, because it is always Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankhara. Rupa is the materiality and then Sanya, Sankhara, and then finally you have the Vijnana. So I think uh, this particular point has to be, I thought, important to lay emphasis on because that that uh, leads to uh, difficulties. Let me just uh, quote an uh, interesting paragraph I found. Buddha says something like this. This is a very general answer to the difficulty at yeah, just this point. Uh, now, Buddha says that, uh, just to prove that I'm quoting the text, let me put it in Pali. Nahang bhikkave loke na vivadami. I do not debate with the world. Lokocha bhikkave maya vivadati, world debates with me. And then he says, Yang bhikkave natti samatan loke panditanan hampitan natti iti vadami. Monks, if there is anything that is agreed upon by the intelligent people in this world that it doesn't exist, I also would say that it doesn't exist. Yang bhikkave atthi sammatan loke panditana, if there is something agreed upon by the intelligent people that it exists, aham pitang atthi iti vadami, I also say that it exists. Now, you know, this, this makes it very clear that Buddha doesn't want to, did not want to go beyond the common sense, parlance. 
then he would not say that the, the individual or the booker doesn't exist because in the world level it does exist. So how I would make sense out of this is, in a somewhat less serious sense, I would say that you look at the skanda, dhatu and ayatana for you to develop an uh, perception in order to get away from the sansara. But on the other hand, if we are the ordinary people who want to be in the sansara, then of course you will have to look at the people as uh, uh, real, real people who are talking, going here and there, and you know, doing all these things. But the interesting thing is both the Samruti Satya and Paramartha Satya, according to the, the, the Theravada teaching, it is not that Samruti is wrong or false. Actually, Samruti is true, and also Paramartha is true. It depends on the, 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 the perception with which what you are going to do. Now, if you want to be in the sansara, there is a way to, for you to look at it and, you know, way to behave. And if you want to get rid of, I think this is where Venerable, you all, I mean, most of your comments uh, rotate around. I really appreciate, but, you know, if I take time to answer all these things, it will take more time. So I will leave at this point, but basically emphasizing that uh, the dependent rising nature uh, of uh, the, the mind, ultimately makes it like mind always as a very complex phenomenon dependently arisen on many other factors. Thank you. Now I'd like to open the floor and the dais to general comments. And anybody is welcome. People on the floor can come to the microphone. People here can raise a finger. Is there a microphone there? I have a small point. You know, once uh, Buddha was sitting on the bank of the river with one of his disciples. And then Buddha told his uh, disciple, look, the stream of the river, it seems to be continuous. But if you raise your level of consciousness, the, there is molecules which are discrete, and there is instance which are disjoint and distinct. So how causality will explain it from Theravadin Buddhism, as well as uh, the story of Jatoko and past life and rebirth, so how can I explain that? Yeah, in fact, um, the, it's very interesting when you look at Professor, the discourses, Buddha has never tried to describe the mechanism of how the rebirth takes place. You know, simply he has uh, assumed that, you know, the vijnana continues. So according to the Theravada, the, 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 the belief that vijnana continues through. So when the last vijnana the ceases in this life, of course, next vijnana rises in association with the body. But the subsequent uh, Theravada tradition later in the Abhidharma, they develop this idea of bhavanga, and then they have the concept of patisandhi. Patisandhi, sandhi means joint. So your la last consciousness in this life, join it with your next uh, existence in the next life. So, but this Patisandhi Vijnana, relinking consciousness is a concept that is not found in the discourses. I mean, my explanation would be that Buddha never went want to go into the mechanism of exactly how it happens or something. He gave a very broad concept that, you know, people will be reborn according to their karma. But subsequent tradition, of course, was forced to explain exactly how it happened. So they came up with uh, this concept of bhavanga. But the interesting thing is, although bhavanga comes fairly close to continuous atma or something, but the distinctive characteristic of bhavanga is that bhavanga is also dependent so Bhavang has to have certain preconditions to arise and then it continues again dependently arisen. So I think where the, the Buddhist concept can say oh, it is so least in order to say that it is dependently arisen, of course, according to Abhidharma. So that way I can see that even the later development is really consistent with the Pratit Samuppana concept of mind. And Professor Wang Chu Dorje has asked for a follow-up moment on his question, so he gets them up. Yes, actually, generally my query was, actually, you know, whether there is, a, you know, consciousness uh, which is distinct to the matter. And why? Because sometimes in Abhidhamma, you can find that in formless realm, there is no such form or matter, but consciousness is there. 
then if that is the way, then it seems that yes, the existence of consciousness is something uh, different than the matter. That was my actually request. Uh, I think, uh, Venerable, that's a very, 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 very good um, observation. Now, there are certain uh, references in the, in, the, in the discourses or in the Buddhist literature where it's called Asangmi Sattva. Now, Asangmi Sattva means there can be existence, the, the people, I mean the certain forms of life, without Sangmiya, without perception. But without perception doesn't necessarily mean that there is no consciousness. Uh, this, uh, the Rupa and Arupa, particularly Arupa. Arupa means without no physical basis. But I think understanding is there is a very subtle form of Rupa. So it's not completely, necessarily total absence of Rupa, but it is very subtle form. However, for me, uh, I would consider the, the analysis of mind as it exists in our day-to-day -day experience and this world is the more important thing than, of course, admitting your point is a valid point, because, you know, this Arupa existence is a very, not a central uh, conception in the Buddhist tradition. Although technically, logically, you're right, because if you believe in Arupa, then which means that we say that uh, the consciousness can exist without Rupa. Technically, but but I, I, I the, the, the what is the text say that there is a very subtle form of rupa, but on the other hand, as a, I mean the person interested in you know the empirical philosophy, I would not really take this particular this thing in a very serious manner. I would rather go check into the you know what is described the empirical reality as well of relations. Is there anybody from the floor who wishes to approach the microphone? It remains open. Yes, Dr. Pema Tenten. It's on. It's on. Hi, ah, it's on. Uh, Honorable Professor Tilakratnaji, I have a very small query about the Atma. At the end of your lecture, you said, uh, in Theravada, there's, uh, there's no Atma, but in the Atma was replaced by Chitta, yeah? But when we read Dhammapada, Buddha says, says Atma hi Atnu Natha Ko Natha Parusya. And if you say that Atma is used here as a self, then again I have to say that if the self and Chitta is synonym or different, please. Thank you, sir, very much for that question. Actually, uh, uh, in a way, it can be answered straightforwardly. The word Atta in Pali language has two meanings. One meaning is it refers to the metaphysical Brahman type of Atman concept. And also in the Pali language, Atta is used as a reflexive pronoun. So when Buddha says Atta ni Atta no nato, oneself is the one, one's protector. So actually it's, it's, a, it's a two different ways of using language. So. Um, Good job. Thank you. I was um, very happy to hear that in the Theravada tradition as well, um, the Chitta, Manas and Vijana yeah. are sometimes used interchangeably in general sense. But Professor, you also pointed out that if you look at the discourses, the terms chitta and the terms manas and uh, vijnana are actually used in different contexts, which uh, seems to be the important point. And although we may in the end say they are the same, but the fact that Buddha chooses to use a specific term in a specific context. Um, so my question is, and, and before I actually ask the question, this reminds me of the Yogacara, Asanga's Yogacara philosophy, where Sometimes, I mean, he does choose both options. He says all three of them can be used interchangeably. But then he says, alternatively, chitta is alaya, which is the, very similar to the bhavanga mind. It's a store consciousness. And it's because it's chitta, because it's the repository of all the experiences, vasanas, and so on. And uh, manas is the eye maker. 
it's the it's the it's the manas is the faculty the mental faculty that grasps onto the alaya and builds up the notion of self and vijnana are the other consciousnesses five senses and one mental which then engage with the world and produces these vasanas so he seems to say that yes on the one hand you can use them in the change but on the other actually you can also use them distinctly so can you elaborate a bit more on why do you think in the discourses these theory terms were used in a specific way in this context thank you very much uh, in fact i have here my third footnote uh, reference to sanyutta nikaya nidana sanyutta uh, sutta number 94 which put the says to that which is called mind mentality and consciousness chittang iti vimano iti vijnana iti so there are several occasions where buddha just uses refer to all these three things and say that which is called this and this and this given the indication that you know it's been used synonymously however as you pointed out when you read the discourses you can see that ultimately mind mano is basically mano indriya as a faculty and also the coordinating thing it coordinates the content of the other things and then chitta is that which is polluted and developed and uh, ultimately you become an arahant by developing your chitta not vijnana not mano and then vijnana is very interesting vijnana is a part of your personality panchaskanda and vijnana is part of your perception every moment you perceive something there is vijnana and also sanvartanika vijnana although the concept of bhavang is not found in the discourses the concept of sanvartanika vijnana continuous vijnana is there maybe perhaps this was one reason why they developed bhavang and even more importantly vijnana is that which get into the mother's womb so that reference is also there so it's very interesting to see that although they have been used synonymously you can see textual uh, reading now the uh, important thing is uh, of course when we go to the main question what is mind ultimately in buddhism i think the answer has to be something very complex and you know disheartening to a analytical philosopher because it is very difficult to put your finger on and say that this is mind according to buddhism because it it, it performs so many things so ultimately like um, when you look at uh, uh, like every thought moment subsequently they went into thought moments so within the thought moments even as his holiness just mentioned just before like you have three moments and so on However, the important thing is, so long as we think in time and space language or thinking, it's extremely difficult to uh, imagine how the entire sensorial experience is transmitted from one thought moment to the other. Because there is nothing. If there is nothing else, if there is no atman, how can you have your past memories and knowledge and answers and answers and all these things? mentioned in the discourses so i think this whole difficulty is to understand how you know this the, the one is transmitted the entire thing is transmitted from one moment to the other now like, buddha never talked about moments but in the discourses he says that even he finds it difficult to uh, give a simile how fast mind is changing so mind is changing so fast but even though it changes so fast i think logically we have to believe that you know it, it transmits everything but the process i think we are ultimately talking here about uh, very much something of course the enlightened people are said to be capable of watching this movement but for the people like us i think we are in the domain of logic right and unfortunately all of our moments have disappeared for this particular session thank you very much and another beautiful